And welcome back to a book review. We haven't done one of these, I think, probably since the last one of the books in this series. I think we've only ever done book reviews of Red Rocks. <laughs> and those dinosaur tacos. True. Actually, we might have also done the spree of dystopian future books. Yeah, we did talk about that. I, I know we talked about it on the podcast. Um, hmm. But, sorry, before we get too lost, what we're actually talking about today is the fourth book in the Red Rising series, uh, Iron Gold. Mm, not Golden Sun, which I keep thinking it's called. Yeah, that's the third book, or is it the second? It's second. A, yeah. Morning Star's the third. Um, yeah, and let's but see. yes, the, the fourth book, or the, 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 the first of the new trilogy. Yeah, Pierce Brown. I was trying to remember the author's name. Yes. Uh, fantastic books. Yeah, so much so that, like, I mean, when you first introduced them to me, and... Good on you for recommending the audiobook, because the guy that does the audio narration for the first trilogy, phenomenal. Um, <laughs> but now this new trilogy, there's a... Yes, yeah, so before we get to that, I, I heavily warned you off of reading the fourth book. Yeah. And I think, much like anything, good or bad, it's... The memory of it gets worse or better over time. Yeah. Uh, so I think maybe I was possibly a bit overtly zealous as to how much I hated it before. But yeah. I will say, when I was listening to it before, I was listening to it in a fairly busy environment. Mm -hmm. So one of the biggest gripes that I griped about were the voices. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but I'm sure we're going to get onto that. So, so uh, kind of a disclaimer, I guess. I have super shit talked to this book in the past, which is why it took um, me so long to read it because I was yeah. like, oh, yeah, the first trilogy wrapped up at a decent point. I, I'm fine okay. leaving it there. But um, then I, I was tempted, and I finally did start listening to it. So, the, what Blue's referring to, one of the biggest departures, is whereas the first three books took place entirely from Darrow's perspective, the main character, and so was read out by one person who did you know, the range of voices for everyone else in the story, but it was always you know, from Darrow's perspective, so it made sense. They made the decision, because in this new trilogy, it rotates through different perspectives, and I think there are four main characters, including Darrow, that it rotates uh, yes. between. And That's each right. one has a different, in the audiobook version, has a different person reading. So, and they, it do, it, it's a bit jarring the first time, because the first switch uh, goes from Dara's perspective to, well, actually, you know what, let's, let's talk about the, the four main characters. So we've got Darrow from the original books. He's the, the red who was carved up to look like a gold and led a rebellion to take down the society. <laughs> if you don't know who Darrow is, then you haven't listened to the first three, or you haven't read the first three books, in which case this review is going to be practically pointless yeah so i feel like we don't need to introduce any of the old characters <laughs> yeah so and that's that's another disclaimer we should put out right off the bat we're going to be spoiling the hell out of the book so oh yes completely um, spoiled yeah if if you liked the first three books and didn't know there was another trilogy which i just found out we, we picked the per perfect time to get back into this because the sixth book the last book in this trilogy is due to come out it's at the end out. of the month yep so uh yeah anyway so first new main character who gets introduced to us is uh, another red a female red called lyria um who's from a, a another mine on mars that got liberated yeah by the way your mic's queuing with background noise oh i've just I've, in the last few seconds i'll be yeah if, it, if it's only a little bit i'll be able to clean it up in the in the oh, post okay, cool. so cool. <clears throat> yeah so, so Lyria, yes, lyria. <laughs> and i i really like i i liked her intro because it kind of gave a lot of perspective on um because she's from the the gamma clan the people who were yes. they were the kind of the collaborators or they were the people who were always made to win in the mines yeah not because like they didn't know any better mm. they were just the odd one out that was picked to be yeah the ones that everyone else hates yeah, basically, and that was one of the ways they controlled the Reds in the mind and prevented them from rebelling. Was they didn't hate the the overlords, 
they hated Gamma because they always won. They got more food. They got better mm -hmm. equipment. They got better booze. Um, anyway, so it was interesting because from her perspective right off the bat, you get the idea or it gets introduced that Darrow's old clan, the, uh, what were they? What, um, was he a Delta? No. Uh... I don't know. But whatever clan Darrow was a part of, now they're like the king high shits and they're lording over everyone else. Yeah. Uh, because and so and apparently there's a lot of animosity lingering towards the gammas even though they've all been taken out. Um, yeah, and um, it's not. Uh, oh, fuck no! Sorry, go on. <laughs> so before we get too deep in the plot, the second character we get introduced to is uh, Ephraim, who is a gray who's mm -hmm. working as a mercenary slash thief. Should we talk about the voice actors first or last? I, I think let's do it as we're talking through the characters. So we'll go back to Lyria for a okay. second. So she, it was extremely jarring for me because you go from the guy voicing Darrow who has a fairly yeah, wide a range. husky Irish kind of mm. old yeah. accent. And then you get Lyria, which is high-pitched and very, very thick Irish accent. Well, the thing is, and... Laria of Lagalos. She... I, I think she did a good job. And the reason... Hmm. I think in particular is because she put some real fucking energy... Yes. ...into it. Like, of all of the voice actors, she felt like the one who was probably... Had probably read all the books hmm. and was super fucking psyched to be doing this. Yeah, and, and I think... It, it came through. I'll, I'll, I have a question I'm going to ask you as we get through the intros for all the characters. Um, but yeah, no, I agree with you. She, besides, I think, go on. besides the person that voices uh, Darrow or reads his ch chapters, I think she is definitely my, my second favorite. She is my favorite my, besides him. She is my third favorite. So I, um, I will say, because I, I, I have my <coughs> audible thing up here, and I was going to see if it tells me who... Yeah, here is narrated by... Tim Gerard, who's the guy that does the Darrow voice? Yep. Uh, Tim Gerard Reynolds. Classic. Yep. Uh, John Curlis, which I think he might be the one that does Ephraim. Uh, Julian Elfer, I think that's she's the one that does Lyria. So, unless Aiden no, Maloney. Julian's a man's name. Oh yeah, it's probably Aiden Maloney then. That sounds very Irish. Anyway, so the the second one, second character is Ephraim, um, and he. Kind of a older gray working as a mercenary thief kind of thing. He's got yep. a little gang of people with him, like a green that handles hacking and a, a red that, you know, does pickpocketing and stuff. And a big. What does the red do, actually? He he pickpockets stuff. I don't remember him pickpocketing anyone. He did. And I missed this the first time I went through the book. Do you remember when Lyria gets caught by the police? Oh, is he the pickpocket? He's the one. I, I, I assumed that was just. Ephraim in a in a flesh mask. Yeah, no. Well, the red is the one that brushes past her and actually takes the lady's bracelet. Ephraim, yeah, it says, sorry. Yeah, Ephraim shows up a minute later as a gray, but with a flesh mask on, and that's his Philippe disguise. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I think the other thing I I was because I was half going with flesh mask theory and a half going with just he just stole the thing from the lady and was like. She, she's a racist gold lady mm. and just pointed at her and said, by the way, she she did it. That's what I thought the first time I read through it. It was only yeah. my second read through of it where I was like, oh, that's what that was. Anyway, so he's got this little gang of hooligans. They, I think in the first scene, they're pulling off a, a heist of some relic, some artifact. Um, taking one of the original swords. Mm. The, the one that I think was the owner... Oh yeah, it was the the original king of Luna. Yeah, the first guy that led the conquering of Earth from the moon. Yeah, I should clarify one other thing too, because I realize this is going to become relevant. There's a ten year time gap between the first trilogy and this trilogy, so it's it's jumped forward ten years. Uh, and yep. early on, the first chapter is Darrow, and it, it's kind of established that um, you know that his rebellion. There's still an ongoing war with what's left of the society, um, so. 
as a result, the, the moon had been like kind of shattered and rebuilt. And so you get a little bit of this from Ephraim's first chapter where he's talking about the state the city on the moon is now. And he talks about how mm. there are these artifacts that are in the museum and where they came from and stuff. And The voice act for Ephraim, second favorite, if not maybe even better. If the original guy hadn't done the first three books fantastically, mm. Ephraim's voice actor would probably be a favorite see I, I put him in third place behind i'm him. glad we both have the same fourth place is all i'm gonna <laughs> say <laughs> yeah because then we get on to um a fourth character which is actually a returning character from the previous books uh the the son or the grandson of the previous sovereign the one that dies at the end of the original trilogy when they overthrow mm. the government um he, uh, what's his name? Uh, Julian? Uh, no, no, that's... Uh, no, no, that's Cassius' brother. Um, oh my god, Lysander. how have I forgotten the... It's Lysander, Lysander, thank Lysander. you. Lysander. Lysander Alun. Yeah, so you we find him, and he's been basically roving the asteroid belt with Cassius. He's been bombing around with yeah. Cassius. <laughs> so, in, in he's grown up now, he's like in his t early 20s, because uh, I think he was like 10 or 11 when the first series ended. Um, yeah. And so Cassius, who helped Dara out in the end, and then decided to just go into exile after the rebellion, uh, has been roving around um, the asteroid belt, trying to, like, right wrongs and help people, and I don't know. They're, they're, they're going around like a, like a Robin Hood band, kind yeah, of. Yeah, vigilantes. Yeah. And so I think the first chapter, they see, like, an obsidian pirate ship. Uh, I can't remember what they're called, but apparently like, these roving bands of obsidians, you know, go yeah. around and capture ships and pillage like a slightly more civilized version of the cannibals <laughs> yeah they're they're like space vikings pretty much yeah uh Askamani, that's what they're called well, holy fuck hold on it's, it's fresh you in... don't hear that in really any other book at all do you no no you don't and so like it's but it's fresh in my head because i was um i just started re re-listening to it like last week um yeah, so those are the characters, and I think you know, it should be obvious. The guy that voices Lysander is my oh, least favorite voice actor yeah. in this. He, he has, in, in polar opposite to... I'm, I'm just going to say, say the voice actors by their main characters mm. voiced. Polar opposite of Lyria, in yeah. that the guy really doesn't sound like he's got any time for reading this stuff. Yeah. He's like very monotone... He sometimes reads out lines, which it feels like he ended a line at the wrong point. Mm. So the the dialogue seems yeah. quite choppy it, because it, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can remember a few like that. Yeah, um, yeah. He just doesn't seem that enthused. It's a bit muddled, and it's very. Yeah. It's just dull listening for, to For a while, part of me was thinking that, like, um, I don't know, the, they, the direction he was given is, like, you're an aloof aristocrat, and he just took it way too far. But, yeah, too aloof. If it had been more aristocratic, like, I could mm. see... I mean, Cassius is all about nobility, mm. and Lysander is literally the prince of a queen. So, like, you don't get much more up your own ass than those two like mm. you could really put some some color into their into their vocabulary not vocabulary you can't change the words but the, their diction the I delivery guess. yeah yes um but no it's oh yeah so th those are uh, that's our cast of characters and it does rotate pretty evenly between the four of them um it's it, i think it might still be slightly more weighted towards Dara, but when I... there's something particularly important happening for each character, they do get a longer stretch. Yeah, but yeah. I think they each have their own times when they do have longer stretches. Yeah, yeah. So they'll, they'll, they're clustered together, but they all get roughly the same amount of total screen time. For yeah, screen time. It's not a movie, uh, <laughs> but page time. Yeah, uh, and they. I one of the things that I really think that. Chain like adding more perspectives than Darrow added to the story was you really only get two perspectives on what life is like 
uh, in the first trilogy. You get the bottom, which is the reds in the mine, and you get the top, right. which is the golds at the top. But you really don't get a whole lot of firsthand looks at to what things are like for the grays, for the blues, for the oranges, for the, you know, uh, right. ones. You, I, I guess you get a little bit of perspective on what life's like for the obsidians, because they have that whole chapter where they're on the poles. Um, yes. But you don't get anything kind of firsthand. I w- well, I mean, you get, you get a bit of blues, because there's, I mean, the starships are flown by blues. True. And there's the whole scene where him and Severo bust through the, the like, the front of a ship to take it over, and that's where they meet, um, the blue chick that's, that is, like, his captain for the rest of the series. Uh, that... Oh, that that's when that's not when they come through the bulkhead. That's when they come through the through the front window. They, they, no, it's not. It's not the front window. It's um, because otherwise she would have been sucked out into space. Uh, no, that was um, they they break into a lot of there's a, a, lot, there's a lot of moments where they bust through the window of a ship or bust through a uh, bust into a ship. I should onto say. onto the bridge. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was I was gonna say it was it was Roke, but that it wasn't Roke. Yeah, it happens because after because it was no it's it was before, way before, Roke, Roke. before Yeah, no, I meant yeah, it before. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you don't really hear from her. it's like Atlas or something. It's not Atlas. No, I I, I know what you're saying. I fuck, I can't remember um, her name. It's it's yeah. fine. But yeah, so you get some perspectives in the other colors in the original trilogy, but. Now you get some first-hand accounts. So you get a first-hand account of what it's like to be one of the Reds that was taken up from the mines and quote-unquote mm. liberated because her life honestly yeah. got shittier. Um, she get, she's on the drop pod as quite a young child mm. because obviously it was the early pod before the 10 years. Yeah, And it's like the Queen promising everything. And then it cuts to her 10 years later. Yeah, and that's, that's something... Because even when... I mean, it's it's another Red's perspective. You did get that perspective from Darrow, but you never get it to the degree because through her interactions with like normal Greys and with like the the Golds when she actually does move on in the story, um, you you never really got that from Darrow when he was a Red because he only ever interacted with one Gold on a face to face basis, and that was kind of fraught with emotion. It, um, Augustus, when he comes down to the mine and hangs his wife. Oh, oh, when when Darrow was red. Yeah, when he was, before he got carved. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and then, um, so that that's good. And then, of course, Ephraim being a grey, you know, he's sort of right in the middle of things. I, I love Ephraim. Yeah, his his chapters are, are pretty pretty great. Um, yeah, I, I just like him as a character. I like his uh, his depth of emotion. Yeah, he's he's a quite and they, they do tie him back to the original story because mm. when I think he's tied to everything. Yeah, it, I think it's the third book when Darrow gets rescued from the Jackal's place. Um uh the beginning of Morningstar, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When, when he's rescued by the two greys, uh Holiday and um Trig. Trig. Trig is the fiance of Ephraim. And so there's a lot of callbacks to that. There's some lingering bit, but it also ties him to Holiday. And so there's a little bit of crossover there that you see uh, between uh, those those two people. And then of course you've got Lysander, which his chapter really, his chapters in this book is mainly because they're outside of the core. He gives mm-hmm. you the perspective of what's happening in the rims. So like the moons of Jupiter, the moons of Saturn, Ugh. and out and further. Which that was the most the interesting thing about his chapters was figure finding out what those people are doing. What's that face for? Oh, it was every time I heard the words like chapter eighteen, Lysander, and I would just mentally turn off. <laughs> not, not even entirely because of the voice actor, but it was just like it, it was politics. Mm. And very little action or surprise. So, um, like I, the the, I, I won't say why mm. yet, but the entire events of Cassius and Lysander for the whole book, like roughly that amount of change in the universe happened mm. within the space of time. 
that, like, uh, for example, Darrow, like, destroyed Roke's ship, right? Yeah. That had the same level of severity, except the Darrow, when Darrow did that thing, mm. it was, like, a tenth the size, and there wasn't a lot of boring emotions and crap politics. And yeah. Go uh, I, I will say one thing, because I, I have, uh, I know I'm a little bit ahead, I've, I've read a, a few, read, listened to a few chapters from the fifth book, uh, yep. and one thing I will tell you to look forward to, uh, because, and this is 100% not spoilers, they changed the voice actor for Lysander. Really? Yes. Is it only, is he the only one that He's changes? the only one that changes, so far. Oh. So, from where I am in the book so far, um, I've only heard from three characters... One okay. of them is Lysander, one of them is Darrow, uh, and then um, I won't spoil who the third one is, just so that you can... The fourth. Wait, well, is the lady there, still there? there? There might be a fourth one that I haven't gotten to yet. I'm not that far into the book. Uh, okay. Where I am in the book right now, I've only heard three voice actors, um, and mm. Darrow's the same, obviously, but they've changed Lysander. So... No, I'm getting way ahead of myself. So, mm. uh... Yeah, shall, shall we start to, like... Talk Let, about... Let's start with Kavax and Lyria. Well, I feel like before that, we need to start with Darrow's triumph, because that sets the stage for a lot of the stuff that happens afterward. Okay. So the, the very first chapter is Darrow. He has just come home from conquering Mercury. He lost a ton of troops because he fired an iron rain. You find out that the society has been reformed into a democracy, or a republic, really, with a senate. Um... And the Senate told him not to attack, and he did it anyway. And so he, yeah. he conquered the planet, but with heavy losses. And you, it's mm. established that the last remaining bastion of the former society is uh, centered around Venus. Um, but in these intervening ten years, they've uh, retaken the Moon, Earth, Mars, and Mercury has just been taken. Um, and so Darrow's back home trying to, you know, ask for more men. It's established that um, they both are fathers now. Like, in the, at the end of the previous trilogy, you found out that Darrow now had a son. But mm. Severo's been busy because he's got four daughters. Wait, he's got four daughters? He's got what? four daughters and his wife's pregnant again when the book opens. I didn't realize he had three. I knew the... the There's one um, that they focus on, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, no, I knew that... His wife was pregnant as mm -hmm. well, but I didn't realize he had three other... <sighs> okay. With Darrow's storyline, mm. in this book, it felt really, really much... Really, really much. Mm. Such language, much wow. <laughs> uh, like, they were trying to absolutely defame him as a character. Like, he doesn't make a single good decision throughout the entire fucking book in the eyes of somebody yeah i think and most of the time that person was me <laughs> i do think that that was on purpose and i think it's on purpose not because they're trying to knock down his character uh but i think because the they're setting him up for some kind of a redemption this book is one thing i'll say right off the bat is this fourth book i felt like every other chapter there was like something that was just like foreshadowing foreshadowing there was a hell of a lot of links, probably because they had four streams instead of one, mm. where they were like, okay, we've got to link all of this together. Yeah. Uh, although they weren't subtle about it. There, there were a few where I was like, I think that they're setting things up for the fifth book. Like, I, I'll give examples as we start to, to go through this, but um, uh, yeah. So, but you're right. Yeah. Darrow, I think they're... they're at this point in his character arc, he's still trying to be the man he was when he was in his 20s, the Reaper of Mars, this this revolutionary war leader who could take on any task and overcome it. And But now he's in, yeah. his, he's in his 30s, he's tired from 10 years of war, but he's still got to, you know, carry on. And He's kind of got PTSD. Yeah. Or, or, like that kind of thing where he... All of his life has been dedicated to war, mm. and now he's not really needed as much, which is, I mean, it's pretty fucking depressing. Um, but I don't know. I just, 
if he had made a couple of really big errors, which he did, mm. that would have been enough. It's all the small ones added on top of it, which really made me think, okay, they just took a monumental dump on the character this book. I, I don't think it's that severe, because if you think of it in the original trilogy, he did make quite a few really bad decisions in that. And usually it happened in the same book. Like, he makes a massive... I think the first book, right, when they're at the Institute... Yeah, like he tried to basically bully his way to be top dog of his house, and it made people start to resent him, and it ultimately ended with Cassius mistrusting him and you know stabbing him in the stomach. The only reason Cassius stabbed him was because of the tape of Julian, which he only he only looked at because Severo tried to steal it from him. That is true. That was a mistake. Although I wouldn't say, like. It's, it's a smaller one, but in the scale of that event. Like, they're all in the Institute, so... Yeah. Not a, on a, he, a solar scale, sorry. but on in the Institute scale, I think it was a, it was a fairly big mistake. And, but then he recovers from it. It was... I wouldn't even call it a mistake, because at that point in the books, he had zero friends around it. Like, he didn't like any of them. Hmm. He was like, I am out to end these people as a whole. So, true. the fact that his cover could be blown by a little fucking disc, if he could get one of the people who he, who is loyal to him to do it, then that does seem like the correct play. I don't know how Severo fucked it up so bad. <laughs> well, the one thing I, I, I will point out is in the original book, he, you're right, he's, that's one, what he, like his big internal conflict in the first book is... Yes, he, he knows he has to hate these people. He's out to overturn their society, but he keeps he says regularly that but he can't just he can't help but like Cassius or Roke or Severo. He actually like starts yeah. to despite him knowing that he's there to bring down their society, he can't help but you know, starting to bond with them. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, but continuing with this book, yes, I, I yes, sorry, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of callbacks. <laughs> well, and as there should be in the fourth book of a series. True. Um, yeah. So Darrow. Honestly, by the end of this series, you can just watch the last episode, and you'll have heard the whole story from all six books. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. So by the time that um, Darrow gets back there, he you find out that Dancer, the red that pulls Darrow from the mines in the original book. Um, he's now a senator and a bit of a prick. Yeah, I feel like you in particular would extra hate it. But just when I was hearing his lines and I thought, oh, Kaiser's going to fucking hate this. Um, I... I wasn't a massive fan of it either. I mm. think there was kind of a betrayal element, not in the fact that he was representing a side. Like, that's fine. It was the then, like, Yahtzeeing his friends into yeah. getting kicked out of jobs and potentially put on trial. Yeah, and I, I got the impression from um, from the the chapters with Dancer in them. They, so he's he started like a political faction within the Senate. So the Senate is broken up into blocks based on the old colors. So you have you know reds, you know reds, yellows, blues, greens. Mm. What what are all the ones? I should feel like I so it's red. Yellow, well, okay, blue. we're going into subcategories. What do you mean? So, like, in gold you have bronzes, in pink you have roses. Yeah, yeah, but that's 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 like saying you have obsidians and you have the stained. So they, they are subclasses, yeah. yeah, but I'm talking about the broad categories. Okay. So we've got, we've got reds who are, like, kind of the lowest caste in the former yep. society. They're, like, the miners, the, you know, dock haulers, the, yeah... The, yep. the labor force. And then you've got, um, uh, what is it? Browns, which are like janitorial or Janus, like yep. midwives and stuff like that. Yellows, yep. which are medical. Um, yep. Oranges, which I think are like mechanics and stuff. Yep, engineers, yep. Uh, you get the blues, which are like the pilots. And that's pretty much it, actually, really. They fly well, shit. Well, anything technical, really. Yeah, anything that they like, that has to be driven or flown or IT based. Yeah. yeah, and then the greens are the like, the hackers, the the super. They're the economists. Those are the silvers. Mm, I thought the silvers I don't and think there are silvers. There are silvers. Quicksilver's a silver. 
I don't <laughs> I could, look, it, look it up. To, double check me by all means, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that Quicksilver is a silver because there's a big point made about him like owning the contract on golds in the original books, and that's, that's uh, okay. A this is oh, this is actually really good. Okay, you found uh, a guide so for on, it. I'm on the wiki. It has a pyramid which dic which dictates the differences between high, mid, and low colors. In oh, that'd order. be useful. Yeah, you, it is really it's really nice laid out. You should send. Um, let me see if I can guess it. But like, yeah, so from so, the top or the bottom. Uh, well, so from the top, I think that the top tier is. Golds, silvers, yep. whites, yep. and yep. coppers. Correct. Uh, the middle colors are going to be like grays, yellows, uh, probably grays, yellows. Who else would I put in the middle? Ooh. Blues, maybe? Yeah. Blues, greens. Grays, yellows, blues, yeah. greens. That's what I'll say is in the middle. Okay. Uh, and then the okay, bottom. You've missed, two. you've missed two from middle. Okay. I'll, I'll come back to them. So the bottom, I think, is going to be reds browns pinks and oranges who am i missing from the middle did i did i rearrange them wrong? you're missing a really obvious one for a start violets i mean yes you're missing violets where do you think violets sit probably in the middle yep um oranges are also in the middle oh so they're not in the bottom okay which is kind of weird because you think mechanics and engineers are yeah, you'd think that they'd be... They're a glorified red, really. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah. yes, you're missing one super oh, fucking obvious duh. color. Obsidians. Correct. And where? They're going to be in the bottom. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'm still missing one from the middle, I think, right? Who am I missing? No, you're not. Oh, did uh, I get... Mid colors, blue, yellow, green, violet, orange, and gray. Okay, I got it. I was, I was pretty accurate. I, I mixed... I swapped a couple of them, and I... Yeah. Uh, greens are programmers and technicians. There we go. Yeah, so th this is how they, they were they were broken up, and they're the color refers to like they have sigils, and they there's it's also implied that a lot of their body pigmentation is different depending on their color. Like the blues all have blue eyes, the greens have green mm. eyes, the reds have red eyes, the golds have like varying degrees of gold eyes. Um, yeah. Some usually. I, I really like the the obsidian style because it's like they've all, they've got like white hair. Yeah, long white hair and just and jet black huge eyes, strapping people. Yeah, like that just sounds amazing. Yeah, no, the obsidians are awesome. I mean, I just mm. I've totally um, pilfered the uh, voice that he does for Ragnar in the original books to use as one of the NPCs in the, our D and D campaign. Yeah, there's a uh, a warlord that they had to negotiate with, and I anyway, that's getting way off topic. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. That's that's all kind of established in the first chapter, like the state of the world, uh, and then yeah, then we go to Lyria, and she is a you know a gamma from a mine on Mars that was liberated by Dancer, I believe, and she's been out in the they they have them in these camps, um, just until they can find other places to put them, you know, work for them to do, figure out what to do yeah. until the war's over, basically, and they've been there for like four years, I think. And so it's her, her sister, her sister's kids, and her brother. And yep. they established that they're, the kids are obsessed with, you know, the, the Reaper and the army. And it's like, oh, we want to be them when we grow up. And um, yep. their two older brothers have all gone off to join um, Darrow's Legion. And we're fighting yep. with them on Mercury. Can't call it the Rising anymore. Yeah. That has risen. <laughs> <laughs> the rise is over. Yes, uh, um, but there is a new faction of Reds, the Red Hand. Which I believe they established from the description is being led by, uh, what's the chick from the original series called? Um, uh, she didn't survive. She got killed. I, I don't think I, she... I thought. Because in, in Lyria's chapter, the way she describes the uh, the person who kills... By the way, spoiler alert... The, the Red Hand shows up in Lyria's first chapter and, like, mercs all the Gammas, including yeah. most of her family. Um, yeah. And the woman who shoots her little brother is described as being a red, a female red with scars across half of her face, or, like, burns across half her face, which is the yeah. description of that, that chick from the original book. Uh, so it was Dancer's girlfriend. Yeah, and I cannot remember her name. Um... 
You keep talking while I think. Yeah, it'll come to us. Anyway, so what happens with Lyria? So while this is happening, um, a military unit comes in to try and stop uh, the Red Hand. I from... keep thinking it's Holiday. It's not Holiday. I yeah, know it's not Holiday. I wanted to say Holiday too, but Holiday's the gray. <sighs> She's um, cool. Yeah, she is. Anyway, uh, so yes. uh, so uh, an army unit comes in to try and stop the Red Hand. She barely gets away with her like her young nephew who was in a, a field hospital. Um, so he wasn't at the home when they came by and shot everyone. Um, and while she's running away, she's got like a bullet wound in the shoulder, a massive like golden armor comes flying down and lands on a riverbed and isn't coming up. And so she swims down and manages to like tie a rope to him and then her and some other survivors like drag him up. Which, I mean, he was in an armor shell, wasn't he? Yeah, I think that's... Because she couldn't do it that's herself. fucking impossible, dude. Yeah, I don't know how many reds they had there on the beach all pulling, but it had to be a lot of them if they got them out. A hell of a lot. Like, just to pull a Telemannus. Yeah, without the armor. At least, like, six reds. Yeah. And then you consider that it's they're stuck in mud. Yeah. Let's say eight. Then they're also in armor to match a Telemannus. Yeah, it's... It's, <laughs> it's like... Maybe, 12 guys. It's just vague enough that, like, maybe we can give them the benefit of the doubt. But yeah, so it, and I mean, uh, the person who is in the armor that they managed to get out is uh, Cavex Au Telemannus. The Telemannus still are my absolute fucking favorite characters in this storyline. So, Cavax uh, is. Cavax is. Okay, yeah, also Socrates, but. Daxo's a bit Socrates? of a prick. Yeah, Socrates yeah, Daxo... is. It is Socrates, yeah. Um, but, uh, so the for, wife's a bit meh as well. Yeah. Um, quickly, for anyone that doesn't remember, and how could you not remember, uh, the Telemannus are a house of golds, and um, the very first appearance of one of them, Pax, is uh, in the Institute with Darrow and becomes one of his closest you know, friends after they kind of butt heads for a while. But they're, they're Not just, really. I mean, he sacrifices himself to protect him. He does, but that's because he's a Telemannus. And he, they're, they're just awesome. Yeah, but anyway, so the Telemannus are described as just... Like, the golds are bigger than every other color except for the uh, obsidians to begin with. But the Telemannus uh, people are described as being even more enormous than that. I'm talking like eight-foot-tall goliaths of, of men. Even the Telemannus women are described as being, like, huge. Um... But yes, and so uh, Lyria saves saves Cavix, um, and then afterwards he's he's very grateful. He comes in to see her personally, you know, talks to her her little nephew there, and um, impresses him. And who is then never seen again? Yeah, they, they mention him a couple times, but you're right; he doesn't really make. He it. is used as a plot device mm. to be spoken of, but not seen. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if he might show up a little bit more in book five and six. I like, hope so, because Darrow's mother didn't appear either, and she was an awesome character. She shows up once in Darrow's first chapter when he's talking to Dancer in their garden. Yes, yes, you're but right. I think that's the only time she appears in the book, other than Because it's reference. her garden. Yeah, yeah. And Dancer's like, I want to do some gardening, but the people won't let me. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, yes. But yeah, so... um she manages to through like uh she talks to Kavix and manages to convince him well convince him to take her and her uh nephew with them off planet mm. and no Ka no socrates socrates him. that's why i was kind of like i was how do i describe <laughs> this yeah she Kavix wants to take her but Kavix's daughter is like no it's against the immigration laws you can't take them all with you they'll all want to come um, and so what he does is puts like some jelly beans in her, her in her pocket when she's not looking, and then the fox goes over and gets him. And he's like, "Oh, magic still exists in the world." Yeah. Socrates then, has given her his blessing, leading to one of the greatest lines, which was, "People generally let you get away with a lot more stuff if people think you're a little bit mad." <laughs> yeah, yeah, which. <laughs> It just it shows that even though he's like very you know flamboyant and over the top and you know bombastic, he he is a very intelligent man. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no, that, I love that line. <laughs> um, let's see what what else is is going on uh, after after that whole thing resolves. You get back. To, I think this is where it focuses on Ephraim for a while, because he he sells the thing that they stole in his first chapter, uh, and then he goes out to a a bar. And this is where you find out he doesn't sell it. He 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 was sent on a job. Yeah, he gives it to his contacts. Yeah, he gives yeah. it to his his contact, and then the contact yeah. transfers his cash. Um, and he goes off to a bar and meets Holiday. Yeah, and this is where they establish that his. Fiance was Trig, Holiday's brother that got killed in third novel. Yeah, and this is also the point where I fell asleep and missed about forty minutes of content, <laughs> and I couldn't be asked to rewind it because it just was dragging. <laughs> I can I, I can summarize it quickly. They have uh, a little bit of a heart to heart. Holiday's like, "What's wrong with you? Like, we're just doing this for you. This isn't for for Trig anymore." And so he basically tells her to fuck off. She leaves. Um, and then he goes and it, it's, it's kind of implied that he's about to jump off of a balcony, um, cause he's just depressed. And then he gets, he's taking Zolodone, which is like this, uh, what is it? It's like an, an emotion. It kills emotion. Yeah. It's an emotion yeah. suppressant like drug. Um, anyway, so he gets knocked out and gets taken before you get introduced to this, uh, taken before the, the Duke of Hands, which is. This guy who's like a lieutenant in this syndicate that's running across the moon. And it's, it's essentially like, a, it's a crime syndicate. Um, and then it's revealed that what the store they stole was actually this guy's. Um, and then after a brief test where they threaten to cut off the guy's hand and he doesn't break, uh, they reveal that, oh, this was all just like a, a trial run to see if you could do a job for us. Mm. And he, Aside from the other trial run, which was them stealing... The sword. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's the the final test is like, are you gonna snitch if we try to cut off your hand? And he doesn't. Yes. Um, and yeah. So and then they they give him the job. They essentially tell him you you have to take this job. It's like you can't say no, but we're gonna pay you good. And they don't tell you what the job is because that's something that gets revealed over the course of the story. I think. Uh, yeah, you're right. They don't tell you, but Ephraim is told. Hmm. Yeah, sorry, they tell Ephraim, but it's never revealed to the reader, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then I think, at this point, it cuts back to... It goes goes back to Darrow, I think, at this point, because there's the whole thing with... You know what, I think I, I skipped a couple things, uh, because I, I did some things a little out of order, because when Lyria goes back with the Telemannus... Oh, sorry. No, go on. T to be fair, you could just do the whole Darrow arc or the whole Lysander arc because they don't touch any other people. That's a fair point. Yeah, let's let's go with uh, Darrow's entire thing through the story just to, okay. to keep it a little bit more coherent. All right, we already talked about Mercury. Yep, and so he's back. He has his hearing with the Senate. And he's back on Loon, that is. Yeah, back on Luna. He's he's before the Senate. Um, he makes his case. He gets you know heavy support from the high and most of the mid colors, um, but the Vox Populi, which is this low color like socialist block in the Senate, it's the voice of the people. And it happens that the low colors there are way more low colors than middle high. Yeah, and uh, Dancer was actually pushing for it to be a representative house. Mm. Basically, so that ninety nine percent of the house would be made up of reds, yeah, <laughs> and there'd be a tiny fraction of the high and mid colors, yeah. Uh, but yes, go. On. Uh, so it's it's revealed, and they, they kind of I didn't realize how much they hinted at this being something that was going to come up uh, throughout some of the early chapters, but it's revealed that Darrow had received and refused a peace envoy from the Ash Lord, who's the one leading the remnant of the society. And um, it was led by, uh, what is it, Cassius's mother, who hates Darrow's guts because he ended, like, her and most of her family. Um, yeah, basically all of them. Yeah. And Darrow is like yeah this this is this peace accord is clearly a trap i'm not going to listen to this get the fuck out of here 
Um, and but he didn't. No one but the Howlers knew about it. Uh, and yeah, he. Uh, but that somehow the Senate found out, and when this is revealed, it's this huge controversy because this is supposed to be something they get to decide on. He doesn't get to arbitrarily say no, fuck your piece. Um, yeah. It's their right to, to hear about it. And so this causes a huge backlash. More of the Senate turns against him. Uh, they ask him to leave and they essentially vote him out of uh, power in terms of like leading the fleet and the army. Mm. Um, and he just kind of goes off. And this is when he, he calls the Howlers together, the ones that are still there on, on the moon. And uh, they come up with a plan to essentially just leave the moon and they're going to go and try and assassinate the leader of the other faction of the um, of the, uh, the the remnant of the, the society. Ashlord. Yeah, the Ashlord. Yeah. And so most of the Howlers go with him. Uh, the Obsidians do not. Sefi, uh, Ragnar's sister from the first or from the first trilogy, she yep. is not happy with him because a lot of Obsidians died in the Iron Rain on Mercury and throughout the war. They take the brunt of the punishment because they're the I've bruisers. I've never been a big fan of Steffi, really. Neither have I. But I don't, I don't think she embodied Ragnar's beliefs at all. <laughs> no, no. Not to the same extent. No one's going to replace Ragnar, though. That guy's just awesome. Well, Ragnar replaced Pax. Mm. Yeah, Pax. It's funny. I, I was saying this to you the other day. Like, it's it's amazing how much staying power Pax has in my mind going through these books. Because he's really only I mean, there he, for three quarters of the first one, and then you pointed out that uh, his name his name is used in all of them. Yeah, they named their ship the Pax. Named after it, and his fucking child was named. Yep. <laughs> my God, get a fucking. You barely knew the guy. There have been so many other people. That have saved his life, and he's still just like, man, Pax, that big beautiful gorilla man. <laughs> I love that boy. Piss on me, Cassius. Uh, but... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a. I can't really say that without context. It's a just an inside joke. Um. Yeah. yeah so, uh, where I completely lost. Oh yeah. So. Um, the Obsidians leave, and he's like, oh, this isn't good, but, um, anyway, the plan they have is to leave the moon, uh, take Quicksilver's ship, and then head straight for Venus and assassinate the guy. Yeah. Um, how they're gonna do this is they break into, like, this essentially maximum security prison on Earth. So they fly to Earth, yeah. Yeah, and there's, like, this underwater prison called Deep Grave, which is where... It's also revealed at this point they abolished the death penalty, or Mustang did when she became sovereign. Well, sort of. They 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 abolished the death penalty. Like they don't kill him; they put him in life in prison immediately after executing her brother. Yeah, which I think they they clarify in the book that this was like otherwise it would be a conflict of interest for her. And here we get to one of the pieces of foreshadowing that I I saw this, and my first thought was like. He, he didn't actually die. Because remember they find that obsidian in the cell and he has no tongue and he's been like partially scalped. And yeah. I'm like... Tongueless. That's the jackal. Oh. That was my first thought. They don't talk about it in this book at all. Like it's, it's not revealed one way or the I, other. I think her pulling her brother's feet was in, in public and her physically doing it was... Proof enough that the jackal was dead. That's that's what I thought too. But I mean, he's got all of the physical character, no tongue, partially scalped. They they describe him as not acting like an obsidian and being more demure and playing with the dog and stuff. And I'm the like, jackal also didn't have a hand. That's oh, that's a good point. But I mean, he that was his choice. They they make a yes. point that they could have regrown it. He just decided not to. By that logic, though, he could also have grown a new tongue, and mm. you know, that's that's a I fair. Don't they they don't they don't say one way or the other, but that was my thought throughout the first, this this whole book was like that's him. Yeah, you you're like on edge the whole time, like he's in the room, he's yeah. in the room. Well, because if you think about it, like they've already established that they're capable of executing someone and not really execute because they they execute a fake Darrow in the first trilogy. 
Yeah, but A, we don't see that happen. B, it's like, the first we hear about that is hear about it being fake. Yeah. I'm just... Like, there was no pre pretense to that. All I'm saying is I'm going to be really curious in book five to see if he actually turns out... If, if, I'm, if my suspicion is correct. Okay. It could just be a red herring, and that's not really what it is, but... That was that was the first thing my mind jumped to when they described him. I'm like, that's him. Anyway, so they go into this prison, and their plan is to break out one of the the biggest, baddest generals that they've captured from the opposing army from the society. Well, I mean, one of the most insane. <laughs> it's about the biggest and baddest. They describe him that way. Um, so it, it's it's. Uh, the oldest brother of one of the characters from the original series, Tactus, who was one of Darrow's followers for a while, but then betrayed him. And then they had a moment of redemption, and then he gets killed by one of Darrow's allies, who's like, yeah, he's going to betray you again. Yeah. And, uh... uh so what's the name? Epidemus? Epidemus? No. What are you... Val the Valley I Wrath guy. Oh, the... That isn't Tactus. Um... It's like Apple something. I, I can only remember his moniker is the Minotaur, and I can't remember his yes. real name. I keep wanting to call him Applesauce. <laughs> Applesauce of Valyaira. I yeah. do love the names that the golds have. Because, I mean, they're, they're mostly like classical, like Greek or Roman sounding. Anyway, so they, they break him out, and they essentially are going to use him to try and get in to uh to get close to the ash lord and take him out so they fly to venus um they tell him he's got a bomb in his head and if he doesn't do what they they want they're just gonna blow his head up yeah which they could have totally just psyched him by the way they didn't even have to put a bomb in his head mm, true um but then they'd have no way to stop him if he did betray them and just start stabbing true but if he believes it enough like the whole thing when they were when he was in the jail cell and they were like, we put a bomb in your head, if you don't do what we say in the next few seconds, we're going to blow it. And mm -hmm. he folds. If he didn't fold... And it didn't go off, then yeah. They could have just pulled out a pistol and shot him in the head. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> this time we put a bomb in your head for real. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so they're going to use him to take o or to try and get there. They, Long story short, they get to Venus... Um, they uh, encounter his brother, who's basically mm. living a debauched life of drugs. Because he sex, betrayed and, his brother. Yeah, and essentially gave up all their family's resources and armies to the Ash Lord. Yeah. And um, yeah, the reason this guy's even willing to go along with it is because the Ash Lord betrayed him to get all his resources and armies. He didn't like the fact that this guy didn't bend the knee hard enough. Um, yeah, so. They do. They make it into the Ash Lord's compound. It's a bit of a bloody conflict um, going through and making it in. But then when they actually encounter him, he is bedridden and barely living. Oh, whoa, whoa. You just jumped to the end. Uh, what, what did I... S I mean... Well, remember, I'm just doing the Darrow arc. This is true. Uh, so, uh, yeah, not much happened during the fight, I guess. I mean, there's a couple character building things. They establish that one of Darrow's lancers is um, his uh, niece, his his uh, brother, whatever his name is, his daughter, and she like went through, got top grades at some academy, and yeah. Um, so now and she's Severo she's... made her clean out his bathroom after curry night because <laughs> yeah. she snuck onto the ship. Yeah, they, they tried to leave her behind because Darrow's brother asked him not to take his daughter on such a dangerous mission. But she snuck in yeah. and, and came anyway. But there's a lot of, like, Darrow telling Severo no. Yeah, Darrow doesn't like this plan at all. That's that's the big character dynamic Severo. between the two of... Sorry, Severo. Severo doesn't like the plan at all. He is constantly telling Darrow, like, I'm only following you because the men need to see us united, but this is fucking stupid. And... Um, Eventually, it comes to the point where after they they get to this point where they find the Ash Lord bedridden like that, um, mm. Severo won't follow Darrow with what he's planning on doing. Um, and 
this this is the only bit I think that ties into some of the other storylines because the Ash Lord reveals that uh, yeah. Darrow and Severo's kids have been kidnapped. Yeah. And uh, so instead of just mercy killing him, they light him on fire. Well, no, no, no. Okay, right. That that this is not me being mad at you. This is me being mad at writing because I think this was played out very poorly. Uh, so it turns out that Ash Lord has been bedridden for the last three years because Applesauce, uh, when he was sent to Deep Grave, he sent Assassins. an assassin in some way to poison the Ash Lord. Mm -hmm. And, and so it's he's actually... basically given him the forever C word. Yeah. Um, and it's been uh, it's it's his daughter yeah. that's been leading the armies in his in his absence, yeah. correct? Yeah. And uh, so so Applesauce is there by the bed as well. Mm. And Severo wants to just kill everyone in the room apart from Darrow, even well, even all but Darrow, mm. because he doesn't like Applesauce because Applesauce is a maniac and. He doesn't like the Ash Lord because the Ash Lord basically kidnapped his daughter. And then Applesauce is like, well, I know. Let's use some cleaning fluid on a lighter to set this old man on fire. Even after he just, you know, ate a poison capsule. And up till this point, Darrow has been like, no, we need to get as much information from we as we can from this guy. Mm. He's got our children. We need to know everything. Okay, light him on fire. It's like, what? <laughs> I think... Like, you were against Severo punching him. I think that, that like, uh, that was up until the point where he found out that they had their kids. Like, no. Once, once he found out that the that, that kids had been taken, then he was just like, yeah, fuck it, burn him. Because he was trying to get information about the kids out of him. And then... He, there was literally a moment where he hesitates, and he literally goes, "Do it." Like, yeah, I, I ah, fuck it. I gotta read. Might as well. I could have sworn it, it didn't happen in that order, but I, I haven't read. The, I haven't gotten that far in the book. I haven't. You finished that part uh, more recently than I have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, regardless, the the bullet points are there. They they find out you know about the the kids being taken, and this is where like Darrow and Severo go their separate ways. Severo's like, you know, we got to go back and save the kids. Fuck the war. Fuck everything else. And Darrow's finding out now from the Ashland. One of the last pieces of info he does give them is that his daughter is now leading their fleet on a surprise attack against Darrow's fleet that's at Mercury while he's away. Yeah. And so the plan is to... I'm not sure why his fleet is in Mercury still. Well, because he was planning on going from there to Venus. He just went back himself to go and... Uh, asked the Senate for more reinforcements. And then they were going to bring it all back to... <sighs> yeah, but... Like... I, the only reason I can see for them just staying parked there would be... Maybe... They needed the ground troops on the ground to make sure that peace was followed through and like... The, Basically, a military presence to make sure that people weren't being anarchic. I, I just assumed well, I it think. was because they didn't want to waste resources. Because if you bring the whole fleet from Mercury to Luna and then back mm. to Venus, you're using like 50% more fuel. Because Mercury to but Venus if... is one planet distance, Mercury to Earth is two, and then you're going to go another planet distance back to Venus. So I just assumed it was efficiency. But on the one hand, the council have just found out that Darrow is gone AWOL. Mm. The first thing I would do as the council is say, right, sending a message out to Mercury right now, pull the troops back. And that's exactly what happens. In the book. Yep. In the book. And it, it's mentioned in another character's chapter, and only as like a side note, like there's a news report on or something. They say that the council is afraid that Darrow is going to go to Mercury and rally his troops against the Senate. Um, so they they recall half of the fleet back to Luna I to protect can't. Luna. Um, I don't know. I, I assume they're going to talk about it maybe in book five. Um, and the reason I'm assuming that is because the way Darrow's arc ends is by him going to Mercury instead because he finds out that his army yeah. is is you know 
probably already fucked. But he places priority on his army over his family. Yeah, basically, and he, he's like, I, I trust Mustang to figure this out. Um, yeah, uh, but Which I. Is fair. Yeah, I mean, he's he's confident in his wife. Um, but this was probably this was the moment in the book where I'm like, okay, we got the old Darrow back because as he's he's taking off and he's heading out there, the last paragraph in the entire book mm. is him just going like. He's like he's going back. He's finally like got that old. He takes the key off. Yeah, he's got the fire back in his belly. He's got the rage back, and I don't think he has that. He's a bit of a pathetic salt at the end. I find. Really, I got the complete opposite impression. I feel he's like he's just like yeah, fuck it, burn the Ash Lord. Uh, I'm not gonna go back with you. I'm gonna go and help I... the fleet. I just re-listen to that last like minute of his chapter because I remember the lines. I'm just, it doesn't feel like, this book didn't feel like Darrow, this felt like a different person. Uh, for the most, for most of the book, I agree with you, and the reason I think that they're setting him up to, you know, this, this is just one long dip for him to recover from in the, the subsequent yeah. books, is because of that, the way they end it. They end it with him going like, I'm back, baby. Yeah. This is... We're an hour in. Yeah. And we've done one quarter of the book. I reckon we split this into two. <laughs> two parts. Two parts, and we'll we'll finish this Yeah. in the, in part two. All right. Well, <laughs> we're, we're going to stop there. Um, this is going to be, yeah. Oh, God. Because you're right. We've still got a lot. I mean, Lysander's going to take like five minutes. Oh, yeah. Lysander <laughs> will take five minutes. We're more but... like a third of the way through. Anyway, yeah. this is going to be the end of uh, part one of the book discussion. I knew this was going to be a long one because, I mean, we both like this book series and we're just going to yep. rhapsodize poetic about it. Um, anyway, look forward to part two. Thanks for listening. You'll see us then. See you later.